Come on. He is risen. And that's why we're here this morning celebrating with millions and millions of people all around the world. Uh, I like to refer to this Sunday as the Christian Super Bowl, baby. This is the Christian Super Bowl. This is when we get to celebrate. This is when we wear our jerseys or our suit coats, you know. And we, we suit up, man, for the day. And it's just so excited, so pumped to be here this morning with you. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 24. That's where we're going to be in just a moment, Luke chapter 24. You know, Sunday, Easter Sunday specific, specifically reminds us of how much God cares. You know, and I think we always have that question, does God care about me and my situation? Does he care about my family and what's going on? And, and Easter Sunday over 2,000 years ago, it reminds us when Jesus came that God cares enough about your situation and enough where you are that he loves you so much. And, and this is why he came. And, and I was just thinking about this whole idea of Easter and Sunday and just expectancy. You know, some of y'all were expecting the tacos, and, and some of y'all may have been expecting an 11 o'clock service, but we did a 10.30 service, so praise God, you're here. And uh, and I didn't even introduce myself, so I apologize. My name is Ben Chapman. I'm one of the pastors here at Luminous, and so it's good to be here with you this morning. Um, expectancy, that's, that's something that we, I want to talk about this morning, because I think this day leads itself towards expectancy. And, and we all have expectancy, right? We've all expected things. It's when you put, maybe put your hope for, for a future outcome of an unknown event, right? Like, you don't know what's going to happen, but I'm putting my hope or, or, or the outcome is going to look like this, but it's unforeseeable. And so, therefore, we find ourselves maybe getting a little disappointed. And, and I, I thought when I was a little kid, just remember when you were a child and it was Easter Sunday and and you were, you were praying, and you know, that the Easter bunny would come, and you were thanking Jesus that you weren't Jehovah Witness, so you could actually celebrate a holiday, and, and you were just excited for the candy, you were excited for what was happening, and, and I remember being a child, and I remember uh, wanting a chocolate Easter bunny, you know, those really big ones that you can get at Walgreens for like a dollar now, you know, and, and I think they were more expensive in 1987 or 88 before both of y'all were born, and, and and I remember wanting one of those so badly. And what I would do is I would have these expectations, and I ran out there, and I looked at my Easter basket, and there was no Easter bunny. There was no chocolate Easter bunny. And then, and then to just rub it into my face, here comes the neighbor over, and he's bringing his candy. And guess what was in his basket? I and mean, a chocolate Easter bunny. And it wasn't just a small one. It was a really big one. I, I so wanted one of those in and hence my chocolate addiction now, right? Because I've been trying to make up for it for several years. You know, expectancy, we, we all expect things. We expect what's going to happen, and we expect uh, life to go well, and, and I think we rarely get exactly what we expect. You know, it's, it's pretty rare that you get exactly what you would have forethought or what you would have hoped for, and it's exactly... What, what, what we want, it rarely happens. We sometimes um, sometimes get what we desire, don't we? Sometimes we get what we desire. You, you ask for a specific birthday present. You, you told your husband, this is where you go get it. This is how much it is. If you go this day, it's actually discounted. So could you do that? Right? And, and so, so, so sometimes we get exactly what we desire. But, but far less often do we get, do we get maybe more than we expect. Very, very few times do we get more than we expected. And, and, and some of you came this morning and there was expectations. There was expectations that, that, that they would have trees on egg, but we ran out of trees on egg, so you had to get bean and cheese, right? Who wants that, really? And, and there's, there's these, all these expectations, and, and maybe you're running late this morning, and, and you were just like, man, I thought I was going to be there on time. Or maybe you went in to go get a carton of eggs so that your kids could, could dye some eggs. And you open it up and, and they were all broken, right? How many of you had some broken expectations before? Broken like a carton of eggs. Or, or maybe, maybe you, you know for sure that this store, no one goes to this store. It's never picked over. And, and I can go on Saturday and I'll be able to find my Easter dress for the next day. And, and so some of you are like, no, this rocks right here. No one touches it. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's brand new. No one 
knows about this one? And, and you realize everybody's whispering the same thing. And they all show up and they take your dresses and you had to expect to see for this dress and now you're wearing what you're wearing today and you look beautiful in, in the dress that you have, but it was not the dress that you would have liked. Some of us have expectations for jobs and job hires and and that uh, we were going to land this specific job and it didn't go as expected. Some of us expected to go to this university and and, and got that rejection letter and they didn't accept you and just another broken expectation. And some of you, as of late in our culture, right, elections have been a lot of broken expectations on, on both sides, red and blue, and which is a lot of broken expectations there. Uh, you know, the thing that's been bothering me lately is taxes. Like, I, I always expect a great refund, you know, I'm going to be able to buy something cool. You know, some of you already picked out what you're going to purchase, and, and for whatever reason, the taxes are, you know, you're, you're owing more this year, and you didn't really expect that, did you? And uh, that was some broken expectations right there. I think maybe marriage could be a broken expectation. I, I remember meeting Brandy and thinking Brandy was going to meet all of my needs. She was, she was, my mom was no longer going to do my laundry. She was going to do my laundry and my dishes. And she was going to take care of me. She was going to make sure I got everywhere on time, you know. And, and I had all these expectations going into marriage. And, and sometimes it is kind of some broken expectations. In fact, you know, broken expectations often, often lead us into some broken relationships, unmet expectations. When we find maybe our relationships being severed, maybe it's in marriage or friendships or family. When we see that happen, and, 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 and one particular expectation that I remember that was broke is when Brandy and I, we had a getaway retreat. And, and we were going really, and we were going to a wedding, and, and we were going to stay in a nice resort. So I thought. So we, we get on hot wire, we get on price line, and we go, we go and we see the, the name resort. Guess what? When they put resort in front of something, it's to be luxurious, right? That's like a getaway, like a given. And then all of a sudden, we end up in New Braunfels at this resort, which I will go unnamed. And, and it's a resort, and as we pull up, it, it doesn't look like a resort. There's no guard at the gate keeping everybody out who would want into this resort. There's just a, a windy road, and we pull up to this to this hotel that looked like a Motel 6, and it looked like there were cobwebs on it, and the lights were dim, and I had a number, and I called the number, and I said, hey, uh, is the resort like on the other side? Because I'm here, and this doesn't look like the resort, and he goes, I'll be right there, I've got your key. So he comes over, let's call Fred, Fred comes over in his Ford, you know, 1997 truck, and, and he shows up, and he says, here's your key, you're right there. I open the door, my wife said, we ain't staying here. <laughs> I go, babe, don't worry. There's grace for this. There's grace for this. There's, there's grace for this situation, baby. We, we can redeem this weekend. There's grace for that. And I want to tell you this morning, whether, you, you, whether you're wearing the dress that you didn't want, or you didn't get the taco you didn't want, or maybe your, the job career that you're in is not exactly what you thought it would be, or maybe your marriage is not exactly how you expected, or, or maybe you, you've had this moment of, of being in a, a resort that was a Motel 6 and, and all that stuff. I, I just want to tell you, there's grace for that. There's grace for that. That, that grace is this moment, this, this, this gift that is given, that, that is unearned or undeserved, that is a gift of kindness. And a lot of us have a hard time giving kindness to ourselves. Uh, we have a hard time receiving kindness, receiving goodness, being, having grace for a situation. We're so hard on ourselves. So, and it will, usually you'll take it out maybe on everybody who's around you. It's hard to have grace for yourself. And we read in Luke 24. It's on a Sunday 2,000 years ago. This particular Sunday, if you will. It, it was Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We read about two men who were going on a road, a journey. And on this road, they, they, they find themselves maybe a little disappointed, a lot of broken expectations. You see, the man that they were following, Jesus, he... He was promising so many things. And he was displaying the promises in the now by doing some miracles, signs, and wonders. He was, he was healing the sick. He was raising the dead. There was, 
There was all these accounts and witnesses, thousands of people seeing what was happening, recording the history of Jesus and what he's done. And so when Jesus spoke, they thought that perhaps everything he said was going to happen in the way they expected. But in this story, these particular men in verse 13, actually, it didn't go as expected. Verse 13, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Jesus himself, Jesus who died a couple of days came and he was walking with them, this, this amazing moment. And I want to just tell you, in whatever situation you're in, in all your brokenness and your unmet expectations, that Jesus will join you in your walking. That Jesus will show up and he's going to join you while you walk. In fact, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says that, that Paul writes this letter, that he is going to come alongside of you when you're going through hard times. When you, when you have unmet expectations, brokenness, hopelessness, disappointment, despair, in all these situations, Jesus is going to show up in that situation as you walk. But in verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. How many of you would love just Jesus show up, but he, you can't even recognize him? Well, why are you there? Jesus, where are you? How many of you ask that question? Where are you, Jesus? Jesus, I'm walking in my brokenness, and you're asking the question, where are you? And in this moment, we realize they kept recognizing him because Jesus was revealing something to them as they walked along the journey. Jesus was moving into a place to try to get to their heart versus just get to their eyes. He was trying to get deeper inside of them, and so they started walking, and Jesus was moving us to a place where we walk by faith, not by sight. Remember doubting Thomas? He, he, in this same day, in this same moment, Jesus uh, is there and he, he, Thomas says, if I don't see the scars in his hands or the scars in his sky, side, I will not believe. And Jesus shows up and reveals himself and he sees but he says, blessed are those who believe and do not see for it. It won't be just a head transfer, it'll be a heart transformation. In verse 17, he asked them, well, what are you discussing together as you walk along? He stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know things that have happened there in these days? Almost sarcastically. You see, the whole city of Jerusalem knew about Jesus. They knew that he was crucified. The, the governor of Rome, one of the governors, actually sentenced him and, and began to try him. It, it was in this moment that the whole city knew. Thousands and thousands of people were coming into the city, and so they were knowing about this event from the countryside. So they sarcastically say, you're the only one who doesn't know. And ironically, Jesus was the only one who really knew because he went through it. He actually went through it, and in that moment, in their despair and in their sadness, they paused. And I think that's relevant for us, because sometimes when we're walking along life and a broken an expectation comes unfulfilled in our life, you're walking and then all of a sudden you feel like your breath's taken away from you, and you pause. You know, it's okay if we don't talk about it, Right? It's okay when we don't talk about me not getting a job or not getting into the school I wanted to get into or, or not talk about the marriage uh, uh, problems and situations that are happening or talk about the kids who are running amok. It's, it's okay if we don't talk about the finances. I'll just, I'll just walk along. Even though I'm sad, I, I can at least walk. But, but it's like you just replay in your head the song that's over and over again of despair and depravity and sadness. And falling short, no unmet expectations, and you sometimes quit walking. In this moment, we see that, that these men stood still. They were, they were disappointed. And Jesus was no stranger for people who would be disappointed. See, in fact, he loved to show up to the people who are disappointed because in that moment, he gets to appoint them for something so much greater than themselves. 
It's in that moment that God starts moving. You see, Mary was disappointed when her brother died. Jesus, if you would have been here, he would have not died. It was the moment where Jesus got to show up and love this woman and care about this woman and reveal himself. In verse 19, what things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. We had hoped he would be the one who would be the king who would redeem Israel from all this oppression. And, 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 and you and I, we would have hoped that Jesus would be this king who would deliver us in this moment right now from our present suffering. But, but it, it makes sense why we would think that, right? Because in Luke chapter 4, Jesus talks about what he's going to do. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. Jesus was here to do incredible things. He was here to, to set people free and to, to heal the blind eyes and to raise the dead. There were so much amazing things. And, and not only that, these friends of Jesus were walking with Jesus and they saw him do it. He just didn't say it. He walked it out. For three years, his friends saw miraculous things, amazing events, almost unexplainable, if you will. For three years, surely he would set us free. Surely he would be the king. But he died. And it was an unfulfilled promise. Here we are on this road, walking away from where we last saw him. Here we are on this road, disappointed and sad, maybe headed back home or another route. Verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us. And he had a vision of angels. He had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. You see, they, they heard about the tomb being rolled away and the tomb was empty, and, and yet they were on the road walking away from the tomb. Isn't that amazing in our brokenness and our unmet expectations when we're, when we're down and out? People try to cheer you up, don't they? Try to encourage you. It's okay. God's good. All the time. God is good. You know, they try to pat you on the back. They try to encourage you. And you're just like, you know what? I just, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Disappointment can lead you further away from where you saw Jesus last. Disappointment can lead you, broken expectations can lead you like, I'm not going to go to that church anymore. I'm not going to hang out with those people anymore. It's brokenness and unmet expectations. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. He started to piece together a puzzle of the prophecies that were spoken. A puzzle that looks much like this video.
Jesus started telling them about who he who he was and what the scripture said in the hundreds of prophecies on a two-hour journey on a seven-mile road. He started revealing himself to them and as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. Verse 29, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over, so he went in and stayed with them. And this is an interesting moment because we know that the Middle Eastern culture has a great sense of hospitality. But we also know that disciples who walked with Jesus for three years, who showed kindness, to those who are around and have kindness shown to them, it was like deposit inside them that I must extend grace to you, sir. Come stay with us. And when and when they had when he was at the table with them in verse 30, he took bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts? burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. You see, when Jesus speaks, our hearts burn. When Jesus speaks, when we read his word, his heart, our hearts burn. I, I never forget my friend Tad, who grew up in church his whole life, and he heard the gospel, and he heard different things, but, but really what he heard was a lot of rules and religion, and, and it wasn't until he was late 20s when he understood the fact that what grace truly was, he describes it as though my heart was burning and I began to discover who Jesus was for like the first time. It became real to me. And in this moment, we see the disciples were the same, that it was becoming real to them. And these unmet expectations that left these broken relationships between them and Jesus and them and the disciples, we find that they are being reconciled to Jesus in this moment. In this moment, that when Jesus was breaking bread in communion, this was where they were finding themselves finding union with Jesus. Their eyes were open. As we took the Lord's Supper this morning, as we break bread and drink from this cup, he says, remember me as often as you do this. Remember me. Your eyes will be open. And in this moment, when he broke the bread, they remembered who he was. And their eyes were open. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. This is when their eyes were open. In verse 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. In this moment, the disciples were, were reconciled with Jesus. But as they were going on this road for seven miles, and, and here they end up in this place of Emmaus with Jesus, and, and they find out who he is, they decide, we must go seven miles back because we left some relationships that we love. We left those who we we're closest to. We left our friends. We, we left them. And, and that's what Jesus does, is he gives grace to you so that you can be reconciled to him, but he gives grace to you so that you can have grace for others. And extend grace and be grace to one another. Grace, this unmerited gift of kindness, of love, a gift that we didn't deserve. Grace, a pardon for the criminal acts that you and I did. You see, you and I, we, we fall short of the glory of God because we have all sinned. And because God is completely holy and completely worthy, any one little sin would separate us from the love of God because he's that holy. And yet, Jesus said, I'm going to sin. I'm going to sin myself and I'm going to come as the Father sends me and I'm going to give my life as a ransom for me. I'm going to give my life and I'm going to pay the price for our sins. I'm going to give them grace so that they can be pardoned. You see, that's what makes Easter so great. It's a true pardon for our criminal acts against God. 
It helps us to extend pardon to ourselves when we had an expectancy of something that didn't happen. See, when we fall short, when we have broken expectations, when we're doing things that we shouldn't do, and when we had all these expectations of this is how life was supposed to go and this is what was supposed to happen, it was, it was grace that was given to us and, and some of us need to extend grace to ourselves, don't we? There's an unknown author who writes this about this story of Emmaus. Their lives prior to this moment were like a smoldering fire that gives no light. Just smoke to cloud things up, but once they came into the presence of the risen Lord, their hearts were ablaze. A burning fire gives light for all to see, and they saw, understood, and believed. All because of the risen Lord. Jesus' victory became their restored hope. It became the anchor of their lives. Today, I want to encourage you that there's grace for that. For the unmet expectations, for the despair, for the loneliness, for the brokenness, for when you thought life was going to go this way, but it didn't end up how you thought it was going to go, there's grace for that. There's kindness for you this morning. There's a gift for you to, to be okay with yourself and to, to move on and to lift yourself up, not by your own might, but because he's given us the ability to do so. Would you stand with me this morning as we close the prayer? I would love to pray with you if you would be so boldly to close your eyes, bow your heads. I think some of us are like the road to Emmaus right here. Some of us are like this moment where we We've been walking away because of a broken expectation and some of us have been walking for years and some of us maybe it's just been a little while. But in this moment of, of, of brokenness and in this moment of despair and loneliness, in this moment of hopelessness, in this moment of wondering what's the point, I want to let you know that Jesus is right there in your walking. He has joined you. And if in this moment you feel like your heart is burning, realize that's the moment that Jesus is speaking. And he's calling out your name. And he's speaking life to you. And he's, he's speaking all these unmet desires and he's giving you new desires. His desires, his goodness, his greatness. And so maybe for the first time you've never felt your heart burn and you've never felt the salvation of Jesus and you've never known him for King Jesus that he wants to rule over your life but today your heart's burning. I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? That's me, Pastor. I just, I feel like Jesus wants to reveal himself to me. He wants to show himself to me. A new and a fresh. Jesus, I thank you for every hand that's raised. Lord, I thank you, God, for just the burning of your Holy Spirit, God, and how you reveal yourself to us. God, I pray that grace would be given. Jesus, as we confess, we were going our own way. And now it's time to turn around and trust you with our life. For those who maybe have some unmet expectations, some brokenness. Maybe life is not going how you thought it would. Maybe it was this week or maybe it was this season of your life. I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Just ask that Jesus would just come and show up and give you hope and life. That he would speak to your disappointments. And then you would quit replaying this broken song that's going on in your head of replaying the brokenness, replaying the brokenness. And I pray, Jesus, right now, with every hand raised, God, as they're even remembering their moment of loneliness, their moment of broken expectations, their moment where they're hurt and they're sad. I pray, Jesus, would you show up right now in that moment? Would you love them? Would you love us? Jesus, reveal yourself and love us. Thank you for your kindness.
kindness. It's so good. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.